All right, guys, welcome back to the show. Uh, today, we have a special guest with Martin Garcia. Uh, he is the owner of Mag Law and the fee attorney for Magnolia Title. Uh, he does a lot of transactions with, works a lot with investors. Uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to bring him on because he can talk, you know, about those of you guys that listen that are investors, you know, from their viewpoint and not just a retail, you know, retail real estate. So, um, Got some questions for him. Want to hear his story? See how he got started. I love origin stories, as you guys know, to see you know what got him interested in becoming a lawyer and you know title and all that stuff. So, uh, man, take it away. Tell us about you and how you you know how you got started. Yeah, no, thanks for having me um, and for making time and uh, want to have fun and hopefully we learn something, have some laughs, and talk some horror stories, uh, and yeah. so people can avoid some pitfalls. Um, I don't know if you've ever directly asked someone in this field, narrowly the title industry, how they got into it. It's literally either family connections mm -hmm. or totally random. I'm the, I'm the latter. Okay. okay. Um, I was at Texas Wesleyan University cause I thought I was going to go play middle infield for the Texas Rangers. No shit. Mm -hmm. And made the baseball team over there and said, okay, great. Once I figured that out really quickly that I wasn't going pro. Um, I started looking for a job and I was a traditional student at that time. It's probably 19. That's when I got into it. Um, was in a English class with a non-traditional student who had three kids, was looking to do a second career, right? Shift change uh, into the law because he was affiliated with the title company. And in that class, again, Freshman English, uh, he had the teacher say, hey, if anybody wants a summer job, there's a posting out here, and I took it. Hmm. Randomly like that, working for a fee attorney um, for a title company that's since then been acquired, but started like that and haven't looked back. So um, you mentioned earlier, I work with investors. That's my bread and butter. Uh, when I go and speak at other uh, events that we've been at together, I always hear investor friendly and knowledgeable. But now that you know how I started answering phones at the front desk for a title company at age 19, and I'm sitting here, how old am I? 18 years later, yeah. uh, I pride myself in knowing the industry outhouse to penthouse, I say. There's nothing I can't do or jump into or advise or lead on in this industry. I've seen it all and I've been the secretary to the ownership. And there you go. So did you grow up and just, I'm just curious, yeah. did you grow up in Fort Worth? Is that where you were from originally or? Not originally. Uh, father is a Marine. Hoorah. Um, I was a military and base baby. I'm from Yuma, Arizona. Don't say 310 to Yuma because everybody says that when I say I'm from Yuma. Uh, from Yuma, we went to South Carolina, East Coast. Then we went to California, West Coast. And when my dad got out of the military for opportunity, that's how we ended up in the Fort Worth area. So growing up, you played a lot of baseball, and you were that was that was the that was the goal was professional baseball. Oh is yeah, that, is oh, that yeah. how? And so, and college is one of the things that kind of made you stay in Fort Worth. Is that's right? That what made you kind of go. That's right. I went to high school in the mid cities, North Richland Hills. Go Hawks, and I went to Texas Wesleyan uh, when I could, wanted to continue playing baseball, and. After Wesleyan, well, during Wesleyan, I knew that I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to practice law. didn't know what field I wanted to practice in. But when I got that job, freshman, sophomore year in college, um, got good at what I did for that operation and knew that I was going to be a real estate and title attorney. Um, so, yes, staying at Texas Wesleyan because of that and – Knowing that I wanted to be a lawyer, I went straight through Texas Wesleyan School of Law, which is now Texas A and M. Yeah, yeah, there in downtown I Fort Worth. I didn't know that they changed. Yeah, uh, I graduated yeah. in twelve, so two years after Texas A and M took over the legal operation. So Wesleyan's still on the east side of town. A and M runs the law school. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I've always just over the years drove around that area for different reasons, and it, it, I'd like to see that area get revitalized. Kind of on that on that note, that's it has some some nice architecture and some buildings across the street. It's just a, I know it's kind of a rough area in some areas, but I always look like man, I'd love for someone to come through and just clean it up. It looked like they were starting on some end of it. You talking about the downtown or the the, the Westland on, on Westland, like right yeah, across the street yeah. from, the, from there is is 
to some nice, you know, it looks, it's got those, uh, what do you call it? Like those nice little retail spots, but they're never right. still kind of hood. You know, this has never really yeah. been fixed up. <laughs> Rosedale like, revitalization. There we go. They've been trying <laughs> to do it since 2005 and before. That's when I got there. But Has it been that long since yeah. they've been trying to do that? Because yeah. I, I, you see the light posts on that side where um, I've always, you know, her and I were driving one day because obviously they revitalized the Magnolia and stuff. And then, mm-hmm. But on the other side of it, I'm like, man, you can see the light post, but it just never like hit. Yeah. Do you know? Have you ever heard any reason why? It's just, I haven't. Yeah. Um, regrettably, I'm not as involved with the undergrad as much as the law operation, and kind of lost touch there too. Yeah. Nothing against A and M; they've done such a tremendous job for the area and the law school downtown. But not being an Aggie per se, I just I'm not as involved with the with the schools anymore. But yeah. uh, hopefully, they they will clean that, it up. Clean it up. Plan come to fruition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it, that ten year plans turning into it's, it's long. A, it's a while. <laughs> it's, it's a while. So I, on, on a, just kind of touching back, so the beginning, talk about beginning days of, you know, of, of being a you know, title attorney and, or just even just kind of that beginning days of getting started. You said you started answering phones and kind of worked your way through. Kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, how I started figuring out that I was pretty damn good at what was asked of me is my phone demeanor. That was one of the first indicators uh, my boss at the time said, are you kidding me? D- don't tell people you're a lawyer. Don't practice law without a license. And I didn't because I handled myself so well, uh, rapport and decorum on the phone. People were calling saying, hey, let me talk to your attorney. What's his name? Martin. No kidding. You know, <laughs> toot my own horn there because that's what was told uh, to me, of me back then. So I said, okay, I think I got, I got a handle on this. So anyway, fast forward to when I started practicing 11 years ago, when I got licensed in 12, uh, by then I was already building my book of business, Mm -hmm. right? As an escrow officer, I had a small book, maybe about a dozen clients, if that. Um, So then just started plugging into the community and groups, again, like I mentioned, that where you and I met and just started meeting people, making a name for myself and, and asking for an opportunity. And that's led to... I can't handle this quick enough, and that that's that's the the fact of the matter. You know, good problem to have, but you know, we're we're figuring out how to grow and and grow effectively and efficiently. Yeah. So, how did you end up on just dealing with a lot of investors and stuff? Because I know that's that's something that obviously you know you, you hear. They're almost like two different worlds. Sometimes it seems like you know you've got agents who they don't really understand certain processes, or mm-hmm. you know you hear. Wholesale is illegal. Like, you can read Facebook groups, man, see all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. The Google lawyers, you yeah, can't yeah, trust yeah, them. Exactly. So what? how did you end up kind of, you know, spending, because some people get into to different business, like in real estate at some level, like even agents. Agents, they, they don't even, they think investors are like a unicorn. They don't talk to them like, I don't want to mess with those people. Or, you know, they're, they know too much or whatever. You know, what? how did you kind of start out working with, you know, investors and that becomes something that you specialized in and got good at? Closing the creative deals, creative financing is how I got my start in the investing world. So even before I was licensed, I obviously worked for a fee attorney whose trade wasn't real estate, So, but had practiced for so long, was pretty proficient, well-versed in real estate. Um, so I said, well, let me, let me take a stab at these types of transactions. I have the me back up. They always say you have the most wealth of knowledge or breadth of knowledge of the law globally when you're out of school. You know, we just taken the bar. Yeah. So uh, I went straight to the property code, versed myself in loan docs, Dodd-Frank, regulations, you name it, and perfected that with him because, again, I didn't have a license at that time. And we started closing owner finance, RAP, et cetera. Things like you said, people are like, isn't that illegal? Mm-hmm. Well, the state bar of Texas still uh, publishes forms for us to use. You think that's illegal? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I get to keep my license. So that's literally how I got into the investing world. The ability to navigate, handle, close, and close well the creative financing deals. And that's obviously led to many others. So you jumped in and who you were working with at the time, they were all about it too. So you didn't, well, yeah, I mean, you were exposed to it early. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, met an agent who focused on getting folks in homes via owner finance because he represented business owners who didn't have W two income, who weren't bankable. Mm-hmm. And when I met that agent and 
researched more about owner finance and later wraps. That's how I got my niche and my start with investors. That's cool. That's cool. Because it's, it's, it's not a common thing. Guys kind of, I just. Yeah. You, most title companies, you know, go team up with agents. Yeah. And just go retail. Yeah. Nothing mm-hmm. wrong with that. That's just not my angle. But my escrow officers who aren't licensed, that's who I encourage them to go do uh, business with as well. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, make partnerships and friendships with. Because that business can be very lucrative as well. But, yeah. yeah. So your main focus is just the investors and stuff. You, but yeah. you guys run some retail stuff. It's just, we do. It's, we it's, do. it's, it's not your like, Hey, I, you're chasing it down basically. That's right. Not the main there, thing. there are enough of us all over the place, not just Fort Worth, all over the state. I think last time I checked, there were over 700 independent title agents. So there's a lot of competition, right? There's some good ones. There's some bad ones. Point is, there's enough for all of us to have good business if you're one of the good ones. So, you know, that's not my angle. I'm looking for investors. I'm looking for volume and I'm looking for commercial, Mm -hmm. right, to supplement the retail that we do. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's talk some, I don't know if it's horror stories, but just some crazy stories. Tell us, you know, you have some idea of some things that maybe you've come across and you're like, damn, like that was, that was wild or don't do that. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Uh, We do see that. Um, let's start with, uh, is, is it a regular thing you see? Like it oh, is, <laughs> it was just by virtue of being an attorney as well. Yeah. Right. Um, not saying that I've gone through, I go through the, those transactions daily. No, but have I been through them? Yeah. Yeah. Like we were saying earlier, that's how you learn and that's how you avoid, uh, pitfalls in the future. So we'll start with the, with the scaries. Horror stories. Mm-hmm. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> I know it. No, I, I hope it's, uh, eye raising, hair raising for everyone. So present day i've never gotten so many alerts from underwriters that say do not close this property do not close this person do not close this entity not kidding i'm getting emails daily wow. at the moment i have five underwriters most if not all of them are emailing daily basically a do not fly list right don't close them because of fraud because of you name it so let that lead into some that i have seen and fortunately did not make it to close, is uh, fraudulent sellers. It's so easy. We're such a fast pace. It's so easy to purport to be a seller. Um, It's such a fast-paced industry. Think about examples where it's land, how much land is being sold right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Out-of-town sellers, right? They either live somewhere else in the state or out of state. So put yourself in those scenarios and say, oh, well, this person's marketing this property as their own and some a bona fide purchaser is going to come and pay X amount and make someone rich right there. And there you go. Um, One of those uh, false sellers that hit my desk, um, I wouldn't get in the weeds there. I find things that give me red flags anyway, namely, let's close in two days. No, no, no. You're on my (laughs) timeline. And if you're not on my timeline, then go take it somewhere else. Yeah. That's where I am, right? We're not going to jeopardize myself or my insured or the title insurance policy in that way. Uh, when it got to my desk, I saw that the property was on the do not fly list. So then I found out that it was at multiple title companies as well, not just me, same property, right? Trying to see who bites and that one fortunately didn't make it to the closing table at none of the three, but can you imagine? I forgot what it was. Maybe significant enough, $230,000. Hey, cash transaction, sure, I'll sell it to you. And that one was an advertisement on Zillow. <laughs> oh. So people are using well-known, reputable companies. Uh, nothing against Zillow, I don't know why I did that, but well-known companies <laughs> and just you know putting advertisements on the net and purporting to be someone who owns the property when they have nothing to do with it. We see that a lot in leasing, like yeah. a lot of yeah. fraud in the leasing stuff. People getting taken for like three grand, four grand. Yeah. You know, I, they, they, they don't want to use an those. agent. They don't want to use an agent. And they're like, they come back and they're like, yeah, I just got taken. We had someone that, that mm-hmm. we know that got taken for that. So, so that's happening on the selling side that you see. So mm-hmm. you get a daily report that just says, nope. Don't do it. If that's you see it. This and I don't get them unless they're across someone's desk. So it's yeah. it's bizarre that daily don't close these folks, this entity, this property, all over the state. 
That's, so they just is there just there's just one big email the state sends out, or is it or is it? It's per underwriter. Per underwriter. Mm-hmm. They're so, just saying, hey, don't do it. That's that's nuts. Yeah. So somebody's so somebody though is getting through with at some point they're, they're scamming. They're actually making it happen. Getting they are scamming it. Yeah. That's nuts to to, to know that. So mm-hmm. it's weird that, that, that that's they're crazy. Creative. Yeah, that's creative, man. I guess yeah. the prince. I guess the prince got tired of what he was doing, <laughs> waiting for wires to be sent back. Yeah, wire, wire stuff sucks. Let's go get some houses. Yeah, yeah, no get kidding. I mean, and and on that note, I tell my folks always see who the email is coming from because someone can impersonate Martin Garcia easily, but mm-hmm. it's not going to be my email. It's going to be a, a bizarre domain, a foreign domain. Mm-hmm. And if you're not looking out for that, number one, and number two, the title company is never going to change the wiring instructions on you last minute. And when someone impersonates you know, someone like me and says, I am going to, you know, we're not going to use this escrow account because we just changed to a new one, send it to this bank. People bite on that. Mm. Yeah. And I've seen hundreds of thousands of dollars go to the incorrect account mm. in that sort of example. Yeah, that's, that's nuts. Then the FBA is involved. Oh, that's a whole nother animal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's that's one of the what 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 other things have you seen or come across that that's either common or just or just some like ugh. Oh. Uh two things. The more recent one is contract for deeds. Mm-hmm. And the last one that we can talk about is um one of my favorite teaching topics is death, um intestate succession probate and navigating those deals. Those get hairy. Um, the contract for deed, um, as investors, you probably know that those laws change. Now it's been a while, probably about 15 some odd years ago, the legislators were harping on executory contracts, contract for deed, et cetera. And people think, but those aren't legal anymore, are they? They're plenty legal. They're just difficult to navigate. One of the most difficult ways to close a transaction or sell a home without conveying a deed in this state. Um, so that's why people run away from them. They're very difficult, they're very buttoned up, and you're very exposed on the landlord seller side, but you can still do it. The uh, reason I bring that up is they were so damn popular before the legislators really harped on them and made it more difficult that when people didn't record, you don't have to, and no one knows about the contract for deed that you and I did together, and you're buying the house. That's happening right now. And why am I telling you this? Because I'm living in this house thinking it's mine. Mm-hmm. It's still in your name. And you're like, I'm tired of Martin living there. I'm going to sell it. And guess what? The title policy, what does it cover? Rights of parties in possession. So then you're stuck with the legal bill, or you, sorry, as the purchaser, <laughs> to get me out because I'm waving a paper saying, I have a contract for deed. I've been paying him for X. Ec- I've seen some 10, 12, 15 years, but the title was still in your name, right? Mm. That makes sense. So when a deed's never recorded and a contract for deed's not recorded, then title isn't aware and it doesn't cover. So those are leading to automatic litigation and I've not been a part of, but one of my clients, I closed somewhere else on that one, thankfully, um, and some of my colleagues in the legal space, uh, actually here in Dallas too, are seeing those regularly. People just, they're, and they're not, it's just common that they're not filing, they're not doing all the right steps. They're not filing with the, with the county and everything. So yeah. And just, yeah. Why, why would they not? Why would they not go through the, the normal steps? I, to me, it, it wouldn't make sense if I'm going to invest in something to not sure do everything I need to do to protect what I'm doing. Y- yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. What, what you, cause... you and I have a little bit more knowledge than the, than the consumer, right? The lay person, because yeah, if you see a piece of paper and you are just a basic consumer out there on the streets, you think, okay, you know, more than a handshake agreement, we have a written contract that says, if I'm paying you X a month for X number of years, you're going to finally give me a deed at some point. I trust it. Mm -hmm. And I have record of my payments. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Bring that to uh, your deposition and, you know, discovery as you're leading up to trial to go prove it's your house and not the person who bought it at a title insurance company. And they can't cover all those expenses. (laughs) Yeah, that's, 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 that's just to me. I I wouldn't. I would want to do all the right steps. I just don't yeah. see why that's you know why why they wouldn't just go. Let's get it. Let's do everything you need to do. Yeah, just, I don't know. I mean, you never know. Let's say, 
hey, why don't we go ahead and memorialize this and record it with the county clerk? And you're like, no, no, it's too much private information in there. I don't want that out in the public record. Yeah. Right? You just never know. Yeah, that too. Tinfoil <laughs> hat. Yeah. yeah. Tinfoil hat. <laughs> <laughs> so what about, so you mentioned, uh, you know, and I know we've kind of come across some situations ourselves just, um, you know, with probate and, you know, kind of talk about that a little bit. You said those, they yeah. get hairy. Obviously, if you have some people that you can't find that own the property in some other situations, so what stuff have you come across with that that's maybe common or or uncommon that was like, ooh, that was rough? Yeah, yeah. So we'll start with I can't find someone. Sometimes you legitimately can't find someone, whether they've been on the streets for a while or they just don't have contact. But most of the time when I pry, then... People start talking, right? You want to get the deal done, then you stop lying. If I feel that you're not being forthcoming with me, then I'm going to stop it. Mm -hmm. And that happens, right? People get ugly and people get greedy and people want their own when someone passes and you potentially have some inheritance or stake in the game, if you will, for lack of a better term. So what I typically see is someone who was taking care of mom or dad, who was paying taxes, who was there till the end, at the funeral, et cetera, you name it, the whole laundry list. Sorry, it really doesn't matter that you did all that, and this person, your sibling that you haven't had contact with or didn't have contact with your parents for the last 20 years, it doesn't matter if there's no will, and that's, that's the shitty part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you don't leave a will, you're subject to the Texas Estates Code. And I have, to ha I have to have that bold conversation with people saying, you got it wrong. Stop reading Google. Let me tell you what the law says if that person didn't leave a will. Okay, That's one. Two, especially when there's divorce and there's mixed relationships. Um, let's say my, my friend's dad passes. Uh, my friend and two siblings are, are the... Uh, survivors, but he actually had a kid out of wedlock, or say he was just married before and had another kid. So it's a step sibling, right? And if he didn't have a will, guess what? That surviving spouse has to involve all the kids. That's mm -hmm. one of many examples where people just have a misconception of the way that title transition works after death if there's no will. Hmm. It's unfortunate. So it's because so it's, that's what do you so kind of back up a little bit and talk mm. about that. So let's say you have, you know, you mentioned that conversation and stuff. So like, how do you get someone to go? So you end up in a situation where you have, uh, you know, a sibling that hasn't talked to the other, and you got to get this thing sold. Mm. How do you usually solve that kind of stuff? Is it, I mean, what can be? Yeah, like I said, I'll pry. I'll get my people on Facebook. I'll get my people to in y'all's world, skip trace, try mm -hmm. to find all information that we can because my default is to not believe someone when they say, I can't find them. They've been on the streets. When I pry, they'll find them mm -hmm. most of the time um, because I need a signature in order to get the deal done. And you know, heaven forbid some title company lets you get to the finish line without them. Everybody should say the same thing. Yeah. So if I legitimately can't find someone, then that's, that's a lawsuit. You got to go get an order and you got to get permission from the local court, um, probably district at the first level to allow you to sell that property or buy it from someone. Yeah. So, Either that or that, let's go to the other extreme. You don't buy it with a title insurance policy, which is super risky, but people do do that as well. Yeah. That's common. You see that? Somewhat common. Yeah. They, it's such a good deal and it's in their eyes, low risk because this person we haven't had contact with in a while or maybe is not even living anymore and who's going to come after me, then I see people go ahead and get the legal documents signed, recorded, and taken care of, but it's just not insured. So. Yeah. So we have a, we, uh, as far as listening base, I mean, we have a, a, our listening base comes from a variety of, you know, investors to, you know, some, uh, to, you know, people who are just brand new. So I know when I, I remember many years ago, I was like, title company, mm. what's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> many, I mean, I know now, but you know, can you kind of break down like the, the, the process? You know, I know some, especially like I know newer agents and stuff or 
you know, people who are just getting in and they, they hear title and they're like, well, what's title? What does title mm-hmm. do? Can you kind of run through that process of what you guys do from kind of start to finish a little bit or just kind of the pull back the curtain a little bit and say, this is what it looks like. like so for instance, we've got like, we've got an investor right now who's new um, and he is, he's buying a duplex. He's going to live in one side. He's going to, the other side's already rented out and he's got all these great questions. Right. And, and, uh, you know, just the other night for some, we do jujitsu, he does jujitsu and he's like, so what should I be doing? I was like, just chill out and look for insurance. There's not really not much for you to do right now. You're in the contract. We've gone through this process, you, you know, and to him, he's just like kind of, you know, just hanging back, you know, doing this thing, waiting for, you know, the closing date. Um, Go get another on, deal. On his, yeah, get, yeah, right. Get another deal, right? So can you pull back the curtain on you guys' side, whereas like what he doesn't see, your start to finish from that process? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm fascinated hearing people describe what we do or tell folks what the title company's role is in the real estate transaction because I we do a lot and it's loaded and it, I think there's no easy way to tell it and quite frankly I bet I could walk into some title companies and say hey what do you do here and some employees won't be able to tell me <laughs> true <laughs> no kidding that's nuts um, yeah yeah I've seen it before so globally we're an insurance product. Mm. So I usually start there. Okay. We are insuring the transaction and making sure that you two are buying what you intended to buy in that contract and that no one can come back and try to say they have a piece, they have a stake, or that you or your seller owes money to, right? I'm insuring. Uh, that's the correct word because it's an insurance policy, not guarantee that what I just said is going to happen. Okay. So on that note, it's where where would I go next there? So it's a the technical term and I know you said you have a lot of new folks, but you got to have some legalese sometime. It's mm-hmm. a contract of indemnity. I am going to indemnify the two of you as my insureds if what I said happens. You guys close, I insure, and someone comes and says, "Hey, your seller owed me money and it's actually a valid lien on this property look up lien if you don't know what that is yeah and then i have to go and indemnify you meaning i have to go and either pay that off fight it pay the legal fees to defend your title that makes sense it is a contract of indemnity between the issuer and the insured okay is it mandatory or required no but if you're borrowing money you're going to have to get a policy because no lender bank is going to allow me to clo- or allow anybody to borrow their money without a title insurance policy. The way that the policy works is if forbid we have to go down that track and defend the title or pay off a lien or ma- one of the many other encumbrances that we see in these transactions, then we have to pay the legal fees or the payoff, whatever, up to the amount of the policy. You buy a $200,000 house, it's insured up to $200,000, right? Uh, But the best part, in my eyes, of what a title insurance policy gives you is you only pay it once at closing, right? And we're backwards looking. That's how I'll leave it. Our due diligence starts when the contract comes in. That's when we go to bat, we start working. And our due diligence is backwards looking, from when we got the contract to as far back as we can research, right? Another legalese, it's the um, sovereignty, right? If you've licensed, you've seen that in your courses. If you're an attorney, you know the property sovereignty. We're going to re- research back as far as we can to see who's had anything to do with this property, who has owed anything, right, that was tied to this property, I want to make sure that I can insure you and get you to the finish line and it's not going to come back to bite my ass or you. So backwards looking as opposed to car insurance and homeowners insurance or insuring something in the future that hasn't happened yet. And you have to pay monthly and it's going to go up. (laughs) Not saying we won't go up, right? (laughs) Um, But our rates fluctuate. Um, But yeah, one time payment at closing and you're insured the entire time that you own the property. Hmm. Pretty cool product. So... When you, um, yeah, so as far as like, as soon as you guys get the contract, because I, and the reason I'm going elementary on it, because just because I know yep. like the agents and stuff that hear this, because 
you know, that's that's someone who we spend a lot, you know, obviously we spend a lot of time, I know listener wise, it's it's a, a mix, but it's nice to have someone else explain it. And mm-hmm. so like, you know, you, you, the contract comes in and then you guys go to work. So pull that curtain back. So you're going to look, you're looking for everybody, looking backwards, you know, so what is it, what, what things do you find that maybe hang up a closing or, you know, you have 30 mm-hmm. days where you're like, a couple hangups that, that give some issues, sure. you know, for anything, uh, whether it sure. doesn't, I mean, and, it doesn't and, have to be yeah. a retail, but just in general, like hangups that you come across that where it should have been done. It could be either done. It could have been done sooner, but it's not, you know, what, what do you, like yeah. Divorces. Sure. Mm. Sure. So yeah, I, I didn't finish that part of it cause I got caught up in explaining the title insurance policy. So contract comes, we go to work. Our due diligence is what I just explained on the title insurance side. We're researching court records, uh, uh, land records, official public records, you name it, bankruptcy, whatever can affect this property. So once we compile all that information and finish our due diligence, we produce a title commitment, send it out to all parties, and give you the roadmap to get to closing, right? Um, so the roadmap could possibly turn up some items that no one was aware of, uh, divorce. So my title commitment reveals that there's two owners, whereas the contract that you presented only has one person. Well, why? Let's start asking questions. Let's start mm-hmm. cleaning up the roadmap and checking everything off of the punch list. Well, no, we divorced uh, three or four years ago. Well, you used a Google doc to divorce and not an attorney. You didn't do it properly, and he or she still has an interest in this property. Common hang up. Very common. <laughs> the Google attorney? Yes. You see that all the time? Yes. <laughs> I literally saw one the other day where they didn't put anything on the Google Doc. They just put their names, nothing. I don't even know if they had kids. They didn't put their property. Judge signed it, I guess, because they were insolvent and judges felt bad and said, let's divorce these folks, but if you didn't pay for an attorney, I'm not going to be yours, but I'll get you divorced legally. (laughs) So then they call me when he didn't want to get out of the house, but she's rightfully so, wants to sell and owns... I think 50% at least. So, um, yeah, see that. What other hangups um, that are more pertinent to current times and 15 years ago when there was a market crash, folks who get modifications on their loans aren't aware that they're actually signing most of the time another lien on the property, right? Our due diligence and our title commitment reveals multiple filings, and then our sellers are saying, I only have one mortgage. I only make one payment. Well, that's probably true, but did you modify it at some point? Did you sign something? You got your mortgage in 2008. Did you sign something in 2010, change your payment? Well, you added debt, and I guarantee you that's going to happen. It already has started because of pandemic-related loans and modifications. Mm -hmm. So why that's a hang-up is then we have to go and Most of the time, contact housing and urban development and get an additional payoff if the first lien doesn't um, include it in their payoff. And that's a deal breaker in the investment world. Well, and now now you're going to know to talk to or ask the question, if you're an investor trying to work with a distressed seller, did you modify your loan at any time? I know it's in default or it's in arrears or it's in foreclosure, pre-foreclosure, but did you ever sign any other documents? Because I've seen it too many times when that conversation isn't had up front then when I get a payoff and the investor offered X, payoff is Y, deal breaker. Yeah. yeah. So see it too often. So time frames, talk time frames a little bit. Because I know it's, you know, in some areas people are like, hey, 30 days. And I know some, inv- like just like a typical transaction, 30, 45 days, like, you know, that's your closing. Mm-hmm. And then I know also you hear, you, you see guys that are like seven days and we'll, we'll close in seven. You know, they, <laughs> like investors, you know, the cash buyers are, you know, so what time frame do you guys need? And, and you know, just in general, and this might be your specific, mm-hmm. you know, firm or, or you can, but just, you know, what is it that you guys need like time frame wise to be able to do quick closings and that kind of stuff? Like, Yeah. I know you said general, but I'm still going to give you the lawyer's answer. <laughs> you know, it's going to depend on a lot of factors. And these are the most important factors uh, because I close a lot of investment deals. Is it in pre foreclosure, which a lot of my guys do and they've gotten back into the game because of a post pandemic, type of loans and situations. So that type, I tell them, give me two weeks because if the loan is in default, 
in arrears with an attorney. And I have a lot of relationships with trustees and attorneys who foreclose. I do it myself for private loans. But if I can't call someone or text someone or a buddy, it's it's pretty damn difficult to get that payoff from an attorney's office, especially when it's just a foreclosure mill. Mm -hmm. So those I say, give me two weeks. Don't call me on Friday before the first Tuesday of the month when this is going to foreclosure because I'm going <laughs> to pass on it. There's most of the time no way that we can get everything needed because it's not just a payoff. It's other debts that the seller might have. Then the second, I'd move on to what kind of property are we dealing with. If it's a lot and block in a local county, urban, I don't need much. I can probably turn out due diligence in a couple days. And if it's clean, I'll close the day after. Mm -hmm. right? I think the quickest I've ever closed one, probably a day or two. Um, if it's acreage, meets and bounds, um, you know, farm, ranch, whatever, we're back to the several weeks because due diligence takes that long, that much longer in the more rural counties as then I have to outsource due diligence and I'm on someone else's clock too. Um, so generally speaking, if it's lot and block clean, which most of the investor deals aren't clean uh, <laughs> entirely, um, hopefully you guys do have some clean ones every now and then, but uh, those are quick, quick turnaround. So the one that Misty mentioned about the divorce, it was actually one of ours that, <laughs> that we had closed, uh, you know, closed with you guys. And, and uh, we didn't know, you know, it was bought off market and we didn't know that there was a wife because he was already married. And we were like, oh, he's married. And we didn't know there was an ex-wife that was yep, involved. Yep. And so, and we had to stop and they had to go find and get her to sign off and all that because uh, I don't know, maybe he did. He was older, so maybe he did Google Docs. <laughs> I'm not sure, maybe. but that was where she, yeah, that was one of them. So, um, so what about a you know so so you know you mentioned pre foreclosure and stuff. Have you ever you guys have it often or you know where someone maybe the actual seller because you know, you're dealing with investors right? They're out there hustling, pulling. You know, have you ever had a seller just not show? I know it's noise that happens, but is that kind of common where you see maybe some sellers are like they. They don't perform. They don't show up to closing. And they don't. So yeah, performance is is uh, involves so much more than showing up too. So I don't see the no shows as often as I see the non performance. Um, and I guess it's a since it's an element, it, it'll fall into that. Um, so let's start with what I see most often is so cutthroat for you guys, and they're dishonest people on both ends, on the selling end, and in your industry, the investing world. Someone's gonna come and offer more, take the deal away from you guys, coax the seller into signing a new contract, despite being in a binding contract with investor A, right? B is going to come in and so I see that too often. Um, that's the one I see more often than the no-shows and non-performance. Um, for whatever reason, let's think about why they might not show aside from you're undercut and someone else got the deal. Uh, change of heart. I don't want to. I don't want to sell. I don't want to move out of this house. Too many emotions. I need, I'm going to stay here. See you. Go get yeah. another one. Well, when it's that egregious, as you guys know, especially depending on the contract that you use, most of them don't have outs or many outs for the seller. Mm -hmm. Well, my guys will call me, and if the deal's nice enough, we'll sue for specific performance that the contract allows, depending yeah. on the contract you use. Um, Change of circumstance, uh, not just change of heart. Um, be it family, job, whatever, especially pandem pandemic era, there might be some non-performance. Uh, but mostly it's the, I took a better offer. Screw you, Investor A. I'm going with B. That one hurts. I can, I can tell you. Yeah, I, I, I figured I, that I, you've I, been I, through I, it. I, I, yeah, we just went through that. I, it was a, oh, it was a beautiful one. <laughs> and, and, I mean, she was, she was going to sign for... The house would have sold for like four hundred, and she was going to sign for two eighty. And she called me, and it was like, I think I I offered two seventy five. I was like, "There's no way she's going to do two seventy five. I was like, "Just let's put it out there, you know." There's no, all I had to do was fix carpet. They're just like throw some new carpet in. I was like, yeah, that's gonna be great. I told Miss mm -hmm. Taylor, "I'm ready." He sent her the contract over, you know, all you know, Instanet and everything. So so electronic. She's like, "Well, well, you know what? I I want to meet in person." All right, cool. We'll meet in person. So we schedule for that day. That day shows up. I can't make it. Can you? Or can, I'm out of town. Can you come next week? I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like fuck. I know what this means. It's a problem. Because if I show yeah. up a week later, she may sell it to someone else. And 
you know, and like, I, and I'm going out of town. I got to go fight the tournament. I'm like, well, this is, this is it. I can't, I have no choice. Right. Come back. And that, that exact day we were actually recording here. And I was like, she sent a message that said, I already sold it. I sold it. Fuck. <laughs> it's like, I was, I was, I was going to be a pretty penny because I was going to wholetail it. That's all yeah. I was going to do. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I, I wonder what she sold it for. Cause she's like 275. And I was like, I, I said 275. She's like, yeah, can you do 280? And I'm just like in the car on the phone with her going, oh man, that's so, yeah, I think we can. Fuck yeah, we can. It's, <laughs> it's five grand. Yeah. So to see that undercut, we didn't have a contract, but if we did, you know, what do you guys, what do you, I know it's super, you know, how do you, like kind of how do y'all navigate that? I know you can obviously sue and all that. How do you try to navigate that? Because I'm in that situation, we didn't have a contract. You know, it's, I, I love Robin Carragher's like you can't steal in slow motion. Like I just when I heard him say that years ago. I was like, yeah, that's so true. And and I made that mistake by not doing that. But you know, if you get in a situation like that, how do you guys try to solve that, or what do you, you know, solution wise, if they actually yeah, if you have two contracts for the two same contracts, problem. same thing. Yeah, uh, we're creatures of timing. So I build my timeline and mm -hmm. I see what, if anything, has been filed. If it's not a lawsuit, which is what you're ultimate protection is uh, people file all kinds of instruments in the real property records uh, I build my timeline and not just on filings but on the contract and performance delivery money who's holding it so that's how I analyze each deal before then saying okay I recommend this and it's still you know a fine line if it's my title company closing mm. because if I'm listed, then I'm not supposed to represent you, although I I can if the other party signs a waiver, but they won't at that time, right? right. So if I was advising my people on something that didn't close, and that's the most, most of the time uh, they know to call when that happens. Hey, I couldn't get it to you, but this is happening here. Okay, this is what I do. After I build my timeline, then I give the final recommendation. And if there's filings, there's mechanisms, and there's limitations that we can analyze further and see if anything has teeth. Uh, if it's a lawsuit again, then we understand that we're subject to that now. If yeah. Absent an order signed by a judge, then everyone's on pause. Trying to avoid the lawsuit as much as possible. Sure, sure. Even... Costly, lengthy, uncertainty. Yeah. yeah. But, but sometimes it's just not a... Sometimes it happens. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it does. Um, you know, we do, like you said, try to non-judicially solve most of these. They're puzzles, and most of my folks, even the non-attorneys, like solving these puzzles, putting the pieces together, and coming up with solutions to get to the finish line. But, do, you, do you feel like in, in the realm of investors, maybe that's what makes it more enjoyable, or just you, you guys, versus like retail, it's maybe less puzzly? Less puzzly would that be? Yeah, you know, I, I, I appreciate the sentiment because uh, enjoyable is not the sentiment that I would put here. That, you know, these deals make us pull our freaking hair out. And yeah. when my staff sees these, they're like, screw you. Bring us some of the retail easy ones. Yeah. 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 No, they, they do. They're good at it. Some of them gravitate towards it, but others, um, you know, it's, it, it is complicated. And that's why our title company can handle it. And that's why we get folks calling us. You know, can you do this? We're not just yes men. It's not just, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's make some money. No, we're going to do it the right way. We're not going to jeopardize what we do for a living. Uh, we're going to do it the right way because we understand things that some others don't. We navigate things that others won't, mm -hmm. and that's where we are. I bet in retail, um, you might have a similar situation where the seller just decides they don't want to sell or something, and they're under contract. I bet it's more emotional, though, mm -hmm. in, in those instances than, like, with an investment property yeah yeah so let's tie in that with another one that i just thought of um bringing in emotion and family and elderly right absent elder fraud you sign a contract with someone in their 80s call it and daughter comes in and says no doesn't have the mental faculties mm -hmm. you did it under duress this isn't a valid contract well, who are you to say that, Mrs. Daughter? Right? <laughs> so you start getting facts. You start yeah. learning more about why the deal is in muddy water now. And you know, those are things we see. 
do you find a lot of just i mean just kind of talking out loud here do you find a lot of a lot of the investor deals end up in muddy water or do you come across more clean ones on the right and I'm, and I, I when i say that obviously mm-hmm. you're not putting in muddy water it's you know it's already there it's it's already there do you find that that happens more often in that world or do you come across just investor just a lot more clean wholesale clean whatever just boom cut and dry in and out man that made me think about something that i want to mention you know i i said earlier that uh, there's a lot of business for all of us to be fat and happy and successful. And mm-hmm. and with that in mind, I'm friends with a lot of my competitors because that's what makes us better. And that's what helps us navigate stuff like this, right? So I immediately started thinking about what I would ask my colleagues that are also in this space and close the same type of deals because I'd like to see what their answer to your question is. My answer narrowly is going to be, I'm high on the hairy yeah. because they come to me when it's already in deep shit. Yeah, it, I you know someone else had it, and then it came to me because I can help you navigate and get out of the muddy waters. Um, not to say that I don't have some stellar. Uh, I mean, they're all stellar, right? And all of our business uh, associates and friends and contacts, but some people that bring in investing uh, investment contracts, whether it be probate, divorce, whatever, that are just much easier to navigate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I do get enough of those, thankfully, but I, I get a, a high percentage of the hairy. Do you find guys like uh, they start with one company and they're like, it's just not, it, it's, I got to take it over to you guys. Mm-hmm. Do you find that happen a lot? Sometimes they're like, they start here and maybe, maybe they just weren't, you know, they're newer to the game or whatever. And they're like, all right, we got to take it to someone who actually understands that where, you know, somebody's like, well, you can't do that transaction or you know, mm-hmm. do you come across that a lot? We do. We do. Not just for our skill set or our abilities or our reputation, but there are also many underwriters who are not as conservative as others and will allow transactions that others, other underwriters won't. Yeah. So if it lands at a spot where you have the most conservative underwriters, it's got to go somewhere else. Yeah. So what's one of your most memorable deals you've had to work that just sticks out, you know? That would be a horror story, but just... Yeah, no, I, you know, I was going to go happy there. Yeah, One of my <laughs> biggest ones, closing a hotel, because it had a lot of zeros at the end of the day, and that was very <laughs> memorable. It was tough to navigate in, in a sense because it wasn't just the quintessential commercial deal. When you're dealing with the commercial deal and the hotel space and out-of-state lenders and out-of-state lender attorneys, you're in a freaking conference call way too often. <laughs> so... Trying, tiring, all the above. It was very memorable because at the finish line, it was like, ah, okay, we got it, worth it. (laughs) Yeah. How um how long did something like so that one? How many months were you guys like to close? Like how long did that take to just start to finish from contract in hand? uh, All right, guys, we're done. That one was about nine months, nine months, which I thought was pretty good considering everything that we had to go through that I just said. Yeah. Another memorable one was high volume. I think pretty damn close to that dollar amount too. Um, I think this is the biggest one that I've done personally. I know some of my uh, partners uh, have done higher volume, but me personally, we did about 50 properties at once. So you're navigating. Imagine the title commitment that I talked about earlier with not just one track, but times 50. <laughs> you got a lot of paper. Yeah. We're we're a paper industry. Yeah. Did, did they tell everybody thirty days? <laughs> <laughs> right. Here's hey. fifty contracts for. Wait, wait. Yeah. That, was it was it fifty? Was it when I say like high volume? Was it like fifty? Same person buying fifty different ones, or was it buying as a package? Fortunately, yes. The one that I did was same parties. <clears throat> Excuse me, which made it a little bit easier. Um, I I've seen when I was part of a ownership group of a title company the latter, what you said, where it's part of a package where you're not just dealing with one player on the sell side, but you're dealing with one entity or, or corporation or, or trust that's buying all of them. Yeah. So that's, so that's, that's 50, just you have, that's a lot of, a lot of properties at one time just to do, cause you've got X amount of days and the clock hits. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. And yeah, we, 
we can't miss one item, right? <laughs> you know, that, that, I forgot how many pages that title commitment was. You guys know the standard one, you know, 15 pages maybe, uh, that covers all four schedules. This one was several hundred pages long. I'd say, <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Put you to sleep. Yeah, yeah but it can't, can't, because then you're going to file a title, title insurance claim on me, and I don't want that. <laughs> so everybody has their thing, and I'm just kind of curious with, you know, obviously, because title, I guess, it's not one of those things where most, like you said, you stumbled on it. It wasn't like the thing where you're like, man, this is just, I want to go do that, you know, mm-hmm. and you stumbled on it. You know, what's one of the things that that you look at? I know there's stuff that we do, whether it be jujitsu or the brokerage, we're like, man, it's just not my most favorite part of what we do. Do you have anything like that where it's like, you're just not, not saying you don't enjoy what you do, mm-hmm. but there's things where you're like, man, it's just not my most favorite. Or something that can make things easier. Yeah. Um, not my most favorite is, this is an instant gratification world. Okay. Yeah. So I can tell that you two appreciate that statement by your, your tone when I said that. So I'm going to expand on that. And if you're not offering that, and it's not your regular, your A-list clients, uh, it's tough to compete sometimes. So mix in instant gratification in the title world, and then mix in that I'm an attorney who practice. This is practicing law, too, for those folks who think it's not. But I, I'm in court sometimes, right? More often right now than I have been in years. So that's not an instant gratification uh, realm. This takes time. This takes patience. This takes skill, reading hundreds of pages, <laughs> right, to make sure something's not missed. So I'm a hybrid of those two. I have to blend and, you know, be very careful with how I spend my time. You know, I've got a, a brilliant staff. They're awesome. Uh, we're up to eight right now at my office. And, you know, they help me navigate that and continue providing customer service so we can conti- so I can continue doing things like this and bring more business in. Uh, so that's, that's the least favorite part for me because, um, it's, I, I, we, I can say globally, my team, we aim to please and we aim to deliver. And when we don't, it's gut punching. It sucks. That's not what my name and my operations about. And I don't want someone to think that because then what are they going to say? You know, I've got plenty of people, thankfully that recommend me martin's your guy for this martin your guys is your guy for this i don't want someone to say don't go over there i had a nightmare experience i know shit happens sometimes it's not always gonna be perfect and you can't please everyone right Mm -hmm. and you can say no that's okay but it is gut punching whenever we knew that we could have delivered and we didn't Mm -hmm. yeah i could see i mean and just especially if you're dealing with a lot of hairy deals and stuff that that that's got that that can be difficult. That's probably difficult. I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I just kind of what we're talking about. I can hear, you know, that's probably something that, that's difficult with instant gratification and the hair, you know, the hairy deals and yeah, it's like it's almost like a recipe for shit. It sounds like property management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Misty spends a lot of time on property yeah. management. It sounds yeah. like the whole like you, you're fucked either way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, Is that uh, if that's? I mean, you're either way. You're screwed if you're you know you're. <laughs> You do your best you can, and you're like, yeah. you know, you did a good job, but at times where you're like, I know I did a good job on that, like yeah. that was that was, that was right, but maybe that was yeah. just, <laughs> on the other person's side who doesn't understand it. Mm-hmm. To them, it was you know, they're not on the back end doing it, so they don't see it, and so I, I can see that being right. a recipe for <sighs> coming <laughs> home like, dang it, man. Yeah, uh, I've got two points to that one. It's kudos to the people who actually after the transaction say, I appreciate you, you did a good job. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that makes my staff's day, week, month when a lender or, a, or an agent or someone says that because most of the time it's to bitch about you, right? Oh, it's yeah. when it didn't go wrong, the 3% of the time, because the 97% are going to be satisfied, going to walk away, get their payday and not say anything about it, mm-hmm. right? Unless you hound them for a nice review. Yeah, so you that's, don't hear anything unless it's bad. <laughs> and, I, and when you said property management, I'm like, we're almost there too. It's like, unless I get my freaking friends to go and five star me, it's going to be d- tough. Yeah. I offer a $50 gift card or whatever I can do legally at the next department of insurance. Um, don't quote me. I think it's $25. You know, hey, leave me a review. Uh, not just in exchange for it, but I'll put you in a pool to get a gift card. You know, that doesn't even work. So how are you going to get someone to genuinely come back and leave your review? Um, so there you go. Yeah. 
it's like puzzles. The, you, you enjoy doing the puzzle, and it's just a thankless thing. You're just a part. You're a wheel, a cog in the wheel mm. that that actually is a very important part of the wheel. That without it, would be a lot of people that are thankless. Yeah, that, that was, that yeah. Was, <laughs> right. That was my second point, and thanks for reminding me. Um, people think that our business, the title company, narrowly is is a cash cow. Is we just go there and sign, don't we? Well, no. You guys understand it. I know that. But for the newer folks, it's like it's not just the place where you go and sign your documents. Um, I spoke about the due diligence. I spoke about the roadmap. Sometimes those roadmaps are a lot longer than, oh, cool. There's nothing affecting this property. We can close tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Those happen. Yeah. But most of the time, your roadmap and your punch list is bigger than a couple of items. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a lot happening in the background that people aren't aware of. So kudos to the folks in the title insurance uh, industry so everybody else is like the wizard of oz that's why i asked about pulling the curtain back <laughs> yeah they see it and they're like you know to you you know you've been behind the curtain you're you're behind the curtain you know yeah. but, but to them they're just kind of sitting there like can we close yeah know, like, hurry <laughs> and, up and get this done like yeah and that's one thing to other people uh, you know in similar situations in their careers or operations it's mine it's like hey the back to the instant gratification you know um they're uh, narrowly for me you know anywhere from 60 to 100 transactions happening at one time. If I answered all 60 or 100 calls that came in that day, would I have time to do anything or spend time with my daughter or mm-hmm. have family time? No, right? That's what you, you juggle delegation and, and um, you know, handling of how you communicate to continue providing stellar service and running the operation, keeping yeah. business in the door. So and That all comes with, dele- all comes with delegation because I'm sure plenty of people come and they're like, can we just talk to Martin? Do you have, do you have that? We're like, can we just, just yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it. I get it. That's the reputation that, that you build and people say, well, you got to go call Martin, but that also means Martin built a staff that can all but handle most of the questions. Most of them don't need to come to me. Yeah. And it's bizarre whenever they do, um, break the chain or get through the, the gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. And then I get to the question. I'm like, really? That could have been answered at the first level, not the third or fourth or whatever so yeah <laughs> kudos to you guys who who get that far too but yeah most of the time the questions can be answered now if you get you know big time deals that we talked about or or le- legal issues yeah you're gonna have to talk to me so yeah. so how much how much time do you would you say you do you, you spend time representing some of the clients as well not just doing title but mm-hmm. you have clients that you kind of split that up a little bit where you spend some time representing and you know other time Dealing with title, or what does that look like? Yeah, it's not a, a percentage I can tell you. It's just case by case and time by time. Like I told you right now, I'm in court more often than I probably have been in the past five years just because of the real estate climate. So most of my investor clients that have big portfolios, unfortunately, are facing evictions. Mm-hmm. That's where I come in, right? So evictions are up. Probates are up. Um, folks that die with or without a will. Folks that have minor children that would inherit property, which puts you back in court too. So you name it. So we're taking on cases like that. And I can't sit here and tell you how much of my time is devoted to one or the other. The title company is obviously my baby, uh, has been for almost 20 years, but uh, you know, it's, it's nice. It, it's enjoyable practicing. And I more narrowly practice for my clients um, that close with us and, you know, bring us the business here so that we can help them on the eviction, on the probate, on the divorce, whatever. Yeah. That's how we gauge it. Law, so as far as the law firm and stuff, you know, I would kind of title aside, mm-hmm. what do you guys specialize in? Just like your, I, I know investors, but I mean, is there certain types of deals? Is it probate, that kind of stuff that you, like you guys are like, that's just our, that's our thing. Yeah. It, if I had to say what my thing was, it'd be generally real estate, right? That's why I've, we're here and I've built that mm-hmm. reputation. Cases that we take on, forcible detainers, which is the legal term for evictions, probate, um, those two right there. Yeah. So there are a lot of different probate cases that we take on, but probate in general and then forcible detainer. Yeah. Um, myself, I'm not a trial attorney by trade, so I've got a network in my office and with my colleagues that allow us to, if the client needs to go to the appellate level or take something to trial, I can, but you know, I stay in my lane too. I'm pretty damn good at real estate globally, um, but I'm not going to sit there and, you know, prepare for a trial uh, like a good trial attorney would. So I stay in a different lane there. But again, you know, have people on call to be there for my clients if we need it. Yeah. 
So I remember it was the last year. It was last year. Last year we had a uh, Scott Horn on, and he talked about um, one of the first things he said. He was like, "So I, I got out of law school, and that was it. And then I didn't really know what else to do. I just had to go learn. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It, like I just passed the bar, and, and he he made it as a joke. It was something along the lines of like, uh, you know, what's a lawyer? You know, or what do you after you pass the bar? You're a lawyer. Like you really don't. You have to learn a lot. Like how was what, yeah. So kind of back up. What was that like? Because you know, obviously, you know, some people, they, because once you pass, you just, you can go whatever route, right? But you already had a lot, of, you were already working somewhere that gave you that experience. I was in the title industry in 06. Yeah. I got licensed in 12. So I had six years of experience yeah. already, right? Like I told you, answering phones to then two years after I graduated law school, I was a part owner of a title company yeah. for the first time, right? It's been several times now. Um, so my joke in that respect is I'm not diminishing my abilities as a lawyer, but two or three of us that are good friends and practice different areas in Fort Worth say this about ourselves. I am a damn good marketer mm -hmm. and business developer that just happens to be able to practice law. I'm a marketing firm. Mag Law is a marketing firm that just so happens can practice law and close real estate transactions. Yeah. That's how I see myself too. Again, not diminishing what I can do legally in that realm, but you know, we've we've been able to get a lot of business uh, by do, doing events like this, speaking to you know anywhere from five people to the most I've ever spoken in front of was like seven hundred and something people. So I there think you go. Something too, because kind of backing up on what you mentioned, you're it's a student of the game, right? That's pretty much what it is. You're a student of the game. Mm -hmm. You're 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 thumbing through all the property code, and you know you're having to like you're figure it out. Mm -hmm. and that was the, I know that was. What we talked about with Scott, he's like, just figure it out, figure it out. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you know, there's a lot of, it's a lot of learning, you know, and that's kind of what just over the years is I've seen that, that, you know, people think like, oh, you're a lawyer, so you're the, you know, it all. But I mean, truthfully, you're, you're always learning, right? I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, you're always to be. picking something up. You're always learning something new. It's never just, all right, I'm out. And yeah, that's yeah. It. to that point, I mean, the three that are most uh, relevant or that most impact my arena. Property code number one, the estates code number two, the family code number three, mm -hmm. right? We can get into the weeds in the uh, bankruptcy code and others that might be ancillary, but those three right there. So when I graduated, that's what I became an expert at, right? Very proficient, better than that, because I dove into it and knew what I had to do to be able to close all types of transactions. Um, and if... I don't need to be the expert on this part of the family code. Three of my best friends in town and golfing buddies in Fort Worth practice family law. Mm -hmm. I can call up one of them and collaborate, and whether it's business for them or they just get, tell me what we need to do to button ourselves up for the real estate transaction, then there you go. You're good to go. Yeah. So what about, let's talk a little advice, man. What advice would you give, um, you know, anybody who maybe is wholesaling a deal or, you know, they're just kind of, or, you know, they're an investor. I mean, you know, just kind of from your perspective, whether it be title or be just, you know, attorney, like what would you say, hey, you know, this is something you need to pay attention to, you know, when you're out there doing contracts and you know, buying property. Ask about modifications. Uh, <laughs> ask, ask. Is there, yeah. Do you have a loan on this property? Did you sign anything else after you took out that loan? Yeah. Uh, more narrowly here, build rapport in those questions. My most successful investors are the ones that have the patience and ability to have a good conversation, be it the intro by phone and then the face-to-face -face meeting. Mm -hmm. If they trust you, you guys have seen it from investors all over. You'll win the deal, whether you're the highest or not, and the deal will make it to the finish line because they feel comfortable and they know that if they trust you and your title representative is part of your team and your network, they're going to trust me and they're going to know that I'm going to do the right thing and do, you know, do a good job. Yeah. That's what I would first recommend. Get the deal done at the beginning. Build rapport. Have whoever you're negotiating with and talking with trust you that you're doing the right thing and doing them a good thing, right? Especially with the distressed seller um, scenario. Yeah, I like that. You're like it's you're, it's building out a team. You're saying, hey, this is the, this is, you know, you mentioned that like this is the person who 
you know, once you, you should be able to step up and go, all right, we've got another contract. Here it is. And then you can just hand it off, you know, to the title company and mm-hmm. you know who it's going to, That's you know right. who it is. And you're like, done. That's streamlined. it. So streamlined. Yeah. So versus like, you know, bouncing around or this or that, you know, we're going to try this and let's do that. You know, so you, you actually know, it's like the same thing, hard money lender. If you lend with the same person all the time, if you work mm-hmm. with the same person all the time or any of that. They have your docs. They know who you are. You yeah, don't have to ask them 20 questions, right? It's more like four or five. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, and they'll be honest with you. This is a, yeah, this is a horrible idea. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah, if, yeah. They, if they need to give you that, they can tell you that kind yeah. of stuff. You know, yeah. so that, make, that makes sense. So to be able to just basically build a team and say, this is, uh, mm-hmm. this is the person I go to. And ironically, you know, we talk so much investing world, but one of my retail agents is one of my dear friends and he's a broker in Fort Worth. And that's how people gain his trust. Aside from his abilities as a broker and really knowing that area that he sticks to, um, he says, guess what? The guy you're closing with owns the company as a dear friend of mine and you have access to him. Mm-hmm. Right? He gives me a heads up. He's not just going to dish out my cell phone to anybody, <laughs> right? He gives me a heads up. These are my sellers. If they reach out to you to wh- whether they need to feel more comfortable or whether they have a legitimate legal question that we need addressed before we go under contract, they have that access and they start feeling comfortable. Like, oh, cool. The owner, the attorney, awesome. Yeah. Right? Service that we have to offer. That's another big differentiator in this world. Makes sense. Oh, man, I loved having you on. Um, you know, if can you talk a little bit about how anybody can reach you as far as, you know, just your, you know, just I, I know we talked beforehand, you know, so um how would they contact you or work with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Um I'm gonna start with email. It's pretty long. It's uh my name, Martin M A R T I N dot Garcia G A R C I A at Magnolia, like it sounds, title, T I T L E team dot com martin dot garcia at magnolia title team dot com and the easiest way to get a hold of me quite frankly is text um i'm i probably give you an office phone right now but if it changes then i don't want folks going to the wrong location so i'm going to give you my cell if you're going to reach out to me on cell i'm not going to answer a call that i don't know it's just call volumes too high so i encourage anyone who needs to get a hold of me to text me 817-676-2173 Eight one seven six seven six two one seven three. Martin, saw you with the stories. Really appreciate it. Need help here. Text me. Tell me who you are. Give me your name. Then we can work together. If you're an investor, guys, and you need help, you don't you can skip all the other title companies. <laughs> Just work with the ones that work with you guys. Can work with Martin, and they, that's that's what they specialize in. So, um, well, thank you very much for coming on. We Thanks enjoyed it, and hope to have you back soon. Yeah, thank you both very much. Bye.